What is up, SVSers? We are back with another SVS Virtual Audiophile Happy Hour. I am Nick, of course, as always, joined by the Larry and uh, CEO of uh, SVS, Gary Yakubian. Gary, how are you? Larry, how are you? Good, sir. We are stoked and, to be here. Uh, this was, I'm sorry, uh, I, I don't have an ugly t-shirt like Larry or an ugly sweater like oh, Nick. I just have my ugly blazer. <laughs> We're gonna, we were saying you're about the least festive you could possibly be, even if you this were as trying. festive as I get, Nick. I told you that. <laughs> yeah, well, you got a Santa hat coming in the mail. So uh, before Thank we you. talk about the format and some of the big things that are happening tonight, Gary, why don't big you uh, prizes. Well, the big most prizes. prizes we've ever done, right? The uh, well, certainly the most valuable, and then the biggest uh, grand you know, prize. four big prizes. But uh, yeah, before we get to that, why don't you uh, kick everyone off with uh, a, a nice statement, and uh, we'll we'll dive into what's going to happen this evening. Thanks, Nick. Well, as always, we look forward to, this is the highlight of our week. We were just talking, we had our uh, team call uh, today and uh, uh, Larry and Nick and I were like talking about how we were eagerly looking forward to today and tonight's show. Um, it is a weird time, you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic and we always want to make sure that we know some people are out there uh, suffering, um, but it's also a time of hope. It's the holiday season. Uh, it's uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, or whatever you celebrate, and just a time uh, to be to as together as we can be in the middle of COVID. And we have, uh, since our last show, we have two uh, vaccines. So uh, I'm going to just say uh, I'm feeling super hopeful and feeling so excited to be uh, reconnected with the SBS community. And I, I echo those sentiments exactly. And I know there's a lot of people here who are hopeful about the prizes tonight. And uh, we will get to the big prize. But uh, the format, just for anyone, and I saw there was somebody from Utah tuning in for the first time. Welcome. And I know there's a lot of other first timers as well. So welcome to you all. Basically, the way we do it is uh, we just do random giveaways. Uh, my colleague Vince is working behind the scenes. He will choose names at random. We will call them out throughout the broadcast and uh, either contact us or he'll reach out to you and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. We'll get you your prize. And we have four prizes, but I really think it's three prizes and then a mega prize. So we will get to that in a minute. But if you leave a comment, you're already eligible. So that's all you have to do. Leave a comment. You are eligible for any of the giveaways. And you only uh, need to leave one comment. Multiple one comments comment. doesn't, we have a, 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 a thing that makes sure that one, you're, once you've made your comment, you're good, you're entered. But I do like that people have conversations going on in the comments. So I don't feel like you can only leave one comment. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, totally. We, we, just so you guys know, we're watching the comments both on YouTube and Facebook in real time. And um, Nick is doing a lot of the talking, which is his one of his fortes. And so Larry and I are watching the comments. And if you have a good question or one, we'll, one that would uh, work well with um, one of us or our guest, um, we'll totally uh, throw it out there. And uh, Larry, before I let you present the, uh, the giveaways tonight, I did have two questions. What am I drinking? Uh, Basil Hayden's for the uh, bourbon of the evening on top shelf. And uh, it's not a Clemson orange t-shirt. It's a horrifically ugly uh, cat <laughs> holiday sweatshirt. So there you go. No Clemson <laughs> orange for me. Sorry, guys. Um, that is really but, ugly, dude. Yeah, I know. It's actually itchy, too. So I I'm, I'm suffering that. here. I'm suffering in silence. But that's okay, because uh, Basil will make it all better. So with that, uh, Larry, what do we I have on a two -fist, I'm a two-fisted drinker tonight. I've got uh, um, tea in my NPR mug and crystal light in a wine goblet. So. Wow. We're going to have to drag you. Uh, I promise I'll have a drink after the show. Living the high life. Yeah. Big time. And Well, you showed me your mega cherry Coke there, Larry, too. So I know you're yeah, come on, Larry. We don't know what's in that thing. Yeah. Could That's be anything. Right. Um, so, Larry, let's get to it. What are our first three giveaways of the evening? So the first three, we're giving away a pair of Prime Elevation speakers that we've got so you can use them front heights rear surrounds whatever you want to use them for a pb 1000 subwoofer so somebody's going to uh, have that slamming in their home and then a pair of prime wireless speakers so uh we've got Very quite nice. a few uh items for you guys tonight and then one big mega prize that i know nick is just dying to talk about so I've been teasing this in a very corny way, and, and you know Gary gave me some some stuff for it. But uh, we're saying winter is coming for like the past month, and what we have is our uh, piano gloss white uh, ultra bookshelf 2.1 system, and this is an all-in-one ready-to-go system that includes the brand new limited edition SB2000 Pro subwoofer in a stunning piano gloss white finish. SB2000 Pro. 
Pro, my bad, my bad. No, you said it. I think you said it, but just quickly. <laughs> yep, all good. And so you get the Ultra Bookshelves, you get the SB2000 Pro, and then powering that, you get the 300 watt two channel wireless integrated amplifier, our prime wireless sound base. And not pictured here, but will also be included in the prize is a pair of our Ultra speaker cables and our SoundPath uh, Ultra, or sorry, SoundPath RCA audio interconnect. So all the cables you need the speakers, the subwoofer, and the sound base, about a $2,500 system right here that we'll be giving away to the final person of the evening. And the I'm going to say it looks absolutely gorgeous. I'm going to throw a curve a little bit. Don't get mad at me, Nick. Um, it, it looks absolutely gorgeous in white gloss. And if I could turn my computer around, I would show you that I have uh, in my office right now a uh, this exact system, a pair of uh, ultra bookshelves in white gloss. Um, and uh, an SB2000 Pro in white gloss we're, we're hooked up to a sound base. And it sounds absolutely awesome, but it really looks great. Um, but Nick, I think we should, uh, whoever wins this prize can either have it in white gloss, which is, we're celebrating white gloss, which is why it's such a massive prize. But if they prefer uh, piano gloss black, I think we should allow that as well. Is that okay with everybody? I, I have a feeling well, there'll be no complaints about that. Um, but yeah, so uh, there it is in all its stunning glory right there. And uh, I'm going to take this off here. And we also have a very exciting guest this evening as well. One of the first people I ever met when I was in the audio industry. Uh, his name is Brett Butterworth. He's written for a bunch of different audio publications, uh, including Wirecutter currently, Sound and Vision, Soundstage, a bunch of the, uh, the biggest magazines out there. And then also he's one of the few reviewers who can do CEA subwoofer testing, which I know I've seen comments from people asking about that. So we're gonna try to keep it relatively high level uh, in talking about what that is and what it means. And also his uh, you know outlook on being a reviewer. Um, and so we will get to Brent in just about 10 minutes or so. Uh, super excited to have him on to share some knowledge with us. Um, but with that, we wanted to uh, kick off like we normally do. And uh, Larry, I know you've been tuning into some interesting things and listening to some interesting things. Why don't you share with the good folks what, uh, what's been on your TV and speakers? Well, I, we all, everybody's been watching Mandalorian. So uh, we've been catching up on that. Um, there's a, a series on Netflix called The Movies That Made Us. And we may have talked about it months ago whenever it came on, but now they're doing holiday movies. And they did one on uh, the back, kind of behind the scenes of Elf and The Nightmare Before Christmas. And that was fun. And I was stoked to finally get my hands on Tenet and see Tenet. And then I got an ear infection and I can't hear out of my left ear. So I am just sitting here frustrated as I'll get out because I haven't been able to watch it. So Tenet, uh, you get it on Blu-ray? How do you get it? 4K, Blu-ray, digital, all platforms, whatever the advertisement would be. Uh, I love Christopher Nolan movies. He is one of my favorite directors. Um, so I'm pretty stoked to get this one uh, rocking on the system. I want to see that too. Yeah. Uh, I almost went to the movies to see it uh, just because everything going on and I wanted to be out there and support those. You know, of course, I think everyone in the world is stoked for the announcement that happened the day of our last broadcast that all these movies from Warner are coming to HBO. And I think outside of some of the directors and the actors, everybody's pretty excited for that because we're all going to have new content soon. And I'm pretty stoked. Well, I think, we that might makes talk a big, about that I think that actually makes a big statement. And it's, it's, yeah, you should, we, we could talk about it because it's a, a, a massive statement about where the world is going. And um I mean, I could self-servingly say, look, this just puts home theaters that much more uh, uh, in the forefront because first-run movies are coming out uh, uh, on streaming services. But I, I just think it's important for people, for the industry to remain fluid because we love our movies and they can't like define rigidly how you're going to be able to enjoy their movies. Uh, and COVID t tends to not change things so much as accelerate things. That's what we feel like. Yeah. Um, well, we were going to talk about how our patterns of streaming content have changed since the beginning of all this, but I, I want to save that topic. And, and Gary, I know you were on a, was it Kira Knightley kick uh, the last broadcast? Have you? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm calling it my, my Kira Knightley film festival. Cause I, I mean, I'm just, I, I really think she's amazing and I didn't really know that much about her and I bumped into one of her movies. So I did watch the Duchess, but I think what I'm going to say that, that uh, what really blew me away since our last show is the HBO Max uh, sort of semi-comedy, semi-thriller, uh, which is called The Flight Attendant. And it's just, I, I'm going to recommend that one without reservation. It's really fun and well done. And, and uh, 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 the, the finale just came out this morning and I was 
I was waiting for it. I, I watched it while I worked out uh, at six this morning. The other thing uh, that I really enjoyed and, and I'm blown away by is um, Taylor Swift's uh, surprise new album. I mean, this is a, a remarkable run. She's got like 36 songs in the last four months and it's really super high quality. And it also, by the way, sounds really, really good. If you have a high, high uh, resolution uh, uh, streaming service such as Kobuz, we love Kobuz. Um, I, I totally recommend uh, doing it in uh, high res and enjoying it on a good system. It sounds great. And this, the songwriting is just to die for. Um, and then the last one, Nick knows this. Uh, we uh, had a date night on Friday night and watched Washington Performing Arts Home Delivery Plus, their first event. It was uh, the String Queens. And um, it really was, I'm, a, I'm a, on the board of Washington Performing Arts, which is a nonprofit and does uh, uh, arts and um, music in Washington, where I live. Um, but they also uh, do so much for the community and for kids in uh, the DC public schools. It was really gratifying to watch this um, live performance done in a sort of a streaming format, but with, with awesome production values. And I would, and it's really, um, there's, the season is really affordable. You can do, I think it's 13 events going into late spring. I highly recommend, take a look at WashingtonPerformingArts.org. Uh, and I'm, it's, a, it's not a profit thing, so it's a, I'm not pitching you. They're a nonprofit, but I think it's really fun. And the, uh, the um, Apple TV app that they use works really, really well and sounds awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to bring up. It's just, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, people who are forging culture and, and they've lost a lot of opportunity to uh, to generate revenue from live performances. And it's nice to see, uh, you know, organizations like the Washington Performance Arts to, to really do something about that and, uh, and take a proactive stance. So um, hopefully there'll be a lot more of that to come. And I know with, uh, you know, what Warner is doing with uh, their movie launches on HBO Max, it seems like the uh, industry is reacting. So um yeah, what have I been watching? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah, well, Nick, uh, what have you been watching, sir? Gary, I did this one just for you. Last night, I, I don't know if you've seen the uh, Miles Davis documentary, Birth of the Cool. Uh, yep. It seems like something you might have checked out. Yeah, so I, I watched that because I, you know, I always liked his music, but I never knew anything really about Miles Davis. So I found that to be very interesting in terms of how much of like a... Uh, uh, he just guided so many people into the world of jazz and was such like a fixture across different genres. And I don't think I really realized that about him just listening to some of uh, you know his music on my own. So it was interesting to see just how much of a force he was in terms of you know bringing different types of music together. And I found that probably the most interesting part of it. Um, I mean, he's, as you guys know, he's one of my personal heroes. I named my second son, <laughs> his middle name is Miles. So that tells you something right there. Um, what he means to me is, uh, among many other things, is he never stopped uh, evolving ever. He went from the 50s, uh, kind of what was called at the time cool jazz, and then they kind of invented what got the name modal jazz, but it was it's just this beautiful, almost classical approach to creating jazz uh, that culminated in the very famous kind of blue, the greatest selling jazz album of all time. And then he just dropped everything and, and went uh, and created a completely different quintet with completely different players. And damned if he didn't, sorry for my bad language, <laughs> damned if he didn't uh, top it uh, with this, the second, what's called the second grade quintet, the quintet that played through the 60s. And then, he, and then he evolved again and basically invented jazz rock with the famous album, uh, Bitches Brew and some others. So I, I, I would say it, the inspiration to me is never stop Willing, being willing to embrace change and, and evolve and learn, um, which I've tried to do in my life. And I know that's kind of a, a strategy or a philosophy of all of us at SBS, right? Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, and I think another band that did that, we uh, mentioned recently on our Facebook page, uh, The Clash with uh, the 40th anniversary of Sandinista, which yeah. got a, a, an incredible reaction. So, um, you know, I think uh, those artists are, sort of have parallels on, on some level. Um, so we're already at well, six sure, because they, they were a, they were called a punk rock band, but then they embraced all this reggae world music and and rap. And they did the first uh, 
basically rap song by a rock band. Um, that's and that's what that uh, 40th anniversary is of uh, the uh, on the album Sandinista and the song The Magnificent Seven. So, but we're getting in the weeds. But this is stuff. Of, I mean, it just shows Larry's so passionate about movies. And um, Nick, you're you're open to anything. I think I'm super passionate about music, as you guys know. All right, well, we owe the good people a giveaway, so I would like to do that first, but just to set the tone, should we go to our guest afterwards? Because I don't know if uh, these home theater blunders and rookie mistakes, like we, that could we can, be a we, do we, If we don't have time, why don't we do, Why don't we bring Brent on? Because Brent is I amazing. So. I, agree. I, I think the first giveaway uh, is a good idea. All right, so our first giveaway is uh, a pair of Prime Elevation speakers, the world's greatest Dolby Atmos DTSX speakers, but also very versatile, able to use the surrounds and other speakers. And our winner is coming from YouTube, and it is Rob Franklin from YouTube. You are the owner of a pair of Prime Elevations. Nice. Uh, drop a note to uh, our customer service team, or Vince will try to hunt you down. Sometimes YouTube people are tricky to find, but congratulations on your Prime Elevations. So with that said, we are going to welcome our special guest for the evening. Uh, as we said, his name is Brent Butterworth. He is a legend in the world of audio media. He has been reviewing audio products for a long time. He is also, uh, for, for companies like Wirecutter, Soundstage, Sound & Vision, Home Theater Review, you name it. He's got a very uh, awesome career uh, behind him, but he's also ahead of him with some of the stuff he's working on now. There's there Brent. he is. And uh, he's also a consultant, and he's uh, one of the first people I've ever met in the industry, and just an all-around great guy. So, Brent, welcome. What are you drinking hi, tonight? Hi, everybody. Hey, Brent. What thanks are you so much for doing this. So great to have you on the show. That's great to be on. So, what are you imbibing in tonight? What's on the uh, the I'm docket for drinks? Uh, uh, Lagunitas, something easy. It's uh, kind of like a uh, uh, it's an easy drinking hop orchard of an IPA. Well, that sounds delightful. Sounds kind of summery. Um, yeah. And well, you're in LA, you, so it's always summer. True. I love that you're in LA because it means it's 2:45 out there, and, and that makes me feel <laughs> really good about myself. Um, yeah. but, but can you give us recommendations for what you've been watching or listening to recently? <laughs> you should watch this <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I okay. Uh, I'm going to, this is not his own. first IPA. I have a feeling. No. You know, <laughs> um, I, there's a wonderful album. It's a, a jazz album. Um, and, uh, it's called Fawn, F-A-U-N-E. And it's by the Raphael Panier Quartet. And, uh, it's just fantastic. It's, it's been on some people's best of the year list for jazz. And, um, it's, uh, just a great recording of a, some just kick-ass jazz performance it's, it's very original it's not it's not you know guys coming out and going you know all the things you are one two three four um and uh, i've got an amazing bass player on it that i just love and i'm a bass player myself so I, I i'm glad i'm glad you brought that up because you uh you play stand-up bass you're one of the uh, my favorite stand-up bass player that i know personally and uh i'm curious like knowing nobody <laughs> i like that nick <laughs> but as, as a musician, you know, whether it's stand-up bass or some other instruments, I mean, how does that uh, affect your, or how has it, you know, sort of framed your uh, your career as a reviewer? Like, does that give you special insights, or do you feel like there's anything you've gained from being a musician that carries over into that world? Well, I have to say, it kind of got me, you know, I, I played as a kid uh, in, in a variety of bands and stuff. And I kind of got out of it once I got into my journalism career, but I got back into it because, you know, I started, I worked at Video Magazine in the early 90s, and I kind of started getting access to surround sound systems, and they were by far, far better speakers than I ever had as a kid. Uh, because, you know, there weren't a lot of good speakers back in the 70s and 80s, let's face it. Um, so uh, I started getting these good speakers, and I started listening to, to stuff, and, 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 you know, CD was out by the time. I was kind of like, God, this is really nice. And I still remember the first time I heard sound staging. I was like, oh. And um, it kind of drew me back into, so I got into music again. I started listening to new jazz stuff. And it kind of made me, made me want to play again. And I started playing again. And I played off and on uh, kind of ever since then. But I got real serious about, uh, I don't know, about four or five years ago. Um, one of my, some of my buddies in New York wanted me to play, go play some gigs with them in New York. And so I thought, well, I better start like actually practicing and, and uh, 
I went to Jamie Abersall Jazz Camp in Kentucky just for kicks. And it was like, oh, it just really sets fire on me. And but the funny thing is, the, the more involved I get in music, uh the less the less uh tolerant I, I, I am of some of the things that go on in, in high-end audio, to tell you the truth. So you you mentioned the speakers sort of drew you back into the music. Was there something that, you know, sort of inspired you to, to get into audio or to start, you know, paying more attention to high performance, you know, speakers, subwoofers, that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> being it, I did, you know, I was a kid, I did a lot of recording. I did some studio stuff and all that, but it was always, you know, these big JBL monitors. And it's like, you know, you don't really know what you're doing, but having, you know, just finally being able to access some decent speakers. And also let's face it. Speakers got a lot better around 1990. And um, so just being able to, you know, being at Video Magazine and, you know, manufacturers would send me these systems and I'd review them. And I'm kind of like, wow, this is great. And I kind of, I got more into the, I, I enjoyed the movie side of it, but I got kind of more into the music side of it. And I was, it was Video Magazine, so I was supposed to be reviewing, you know, TVs and stuff. But I always found the audio side more interesting. And especially when I got into measurement, it got even more interesting because the measurements in video are, in my opinion, really boring. <laughs> so boringness can uh, sort of framed up part of that decision. Um, well, since you brought up reviews and, and whatnot, I'm actually uh, I'm curious as you know, a reviewer, what, what goes into your evaluation process? Like, what are you thinking about when you're actually evaluating a speaker? What are your criteria? And what are some of the things that you're looking to like, you know, either check off, uh, you know, and it, you know, this can go a lot of places, but I'm just curious, you know, what, what, uh, what that looks like for you. I'll be honest with you. You know, if I, when I get a speaker in to test, you know, if once you've really learned a lot about speakers and I've measured, I, I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of speakers and, um, uh, yeah, and I know how they work and, um, built a few myself. Um, I, I look at a speaker and, and maybe I look at maybe they publish the crossover specs or something. I what I take what I know about a speaker and I see if and, and you know like everybody else I'm biased and I have preconceptions. So when I see a speaker, I'm kind of making certain assumptions about the way it sounds. And so there's things that I know will be a problem, that might be a problem with certain designs. And so if I see. Um, if I see, for example, if I've got a speaker with a seven or eight inch woofer and a one inch tweeter, right? I know that that's, it's hard to cross those over right. And I know that if you do them wrong, you start to sound like this, right? Because the eight inch woofer doesn't sound good with voices. And so, uh, and if you do, and you can also get, if you do it too uh, low, you get too much distortion in the tweeter. So I'm looking for things like that. But then I'm also looking, you know, a lot of times I'm surprised. A lot of times my preconceptions are wrong and the designer, um, is able to accomplish good things without, um, uh, uh, you know, with a design that I don't think is going to work all that good. So that's my approach. I mean, it comes from just decades of doing this. And the more you do something, the more you develop uh, uh, knowledge and some opinions and experience. And so once you get to my level of age and rot, um, you, uh, you know, you're basically sort of looking at like, Hey, does this conform to what I think it's going to do, or does it not? Sorry, somebody's bugging me. There we go. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that Gary mentioned, I think, was uh, you know about your review style is that it, it's never about Brent. You know, it's not about that. And what you know, why is that in the industry that there is that sort of sentiment? And you know, what what's your approach? Like, what you know, why why aren't you like that? I guess is one way to put it. I guess it's because to me, I mean, I don't care what people do. And there are some writers that, that weave quite a great tale about how they went to, I don't know, the store the other day. Um, or, you know, and, and sometimes that stuff is, is really pretty great in the hands of a good writer. But, um, you know, I, I, for me, it's more about, I'm so I'm so into finding out what the what the product does and appreciating what the product does that I don't have a lot of room for tales from my own life unless those tales are, are actually part of the review. I'm happy to talk about the things I did during the review, but as far as me talking about what kind of beer I like or what kind of coffee I like or what or you know <laughs> or you know. <laughs> 
my wife heard the speakers from the next room and commented about how great they were and crap like that. Um, you know, I just never really wanted to do that. The stuff is so interesting and speakers are still just so fascinating to me and headphones too, that I just like digging into those and talking about that. There's just so much to talk to talk about, especially once you can do measurements and once you understand how speakers work, which I contend most reviewers do not, and anybody can read the loudspeaker design cookbook by Vance Dickerson and, and understand how speakers work. Um, it's not that hard. But once you really understand it, it's just really fascinating to dig into it and look at the choices the different designers made. And I, I know a lot of these guys and they all have their different philosophies. And it's just such a kick to me to, to put on a new set of speakers and and hear what they did. And it's, it's exciting to me to discover new designers that I love. And it's exciting to me to you know, hear something from somebody that's that's great from somebody who I'm, I'm, you know, whose work I've heard. And it's exciting to me to get something in. It's like, oh, this is a piece of crap. You know, it's, it's exciting to find things about audio. It's just that simple. You know, Brent, you're very passionate, but you're not one of these or and don't let me put words in your mouth. But my sense of you is you're not one of these mystical, you know, um, I would call it maybe even kind of a snake oil oriented uh, tell a story. I, I feel like you're way more rigorous and try to come at it with a level of objectivity. If I'm wrong, you know, totally shoot me down. Well, I kind of call it the ookie mookie guys um, because it's kind of this <laughs> mystical. I don't know, especially the more that I've gotten involved in playing and recording music, the more I realize that that's just like, just some dude's opinion. And, and I'm not really into, I usually phrase that less delicately, but uh, I'm just not into some dude's opinion uh, and, and how a lot of, I think a lot of audio writers talk about, you know, that their job is to talk about, you know, their emotional reaction to the speakers or, or the, the amplifier or the cables or the cable lifters or God knows what. And for me, it's not about my emotional reaction because how do I know what their what what my reader's emotional reaction is going to be to a speaker? Um, given that they could set it up in a in a room that sounds bad or really good, they could they could play different source material on it. Maybe they have some horrible amplifier they use, or maybe they have a great amplifier. I don't know. Um, and who knows what what their preconceived opinions are, what kind of sound they like, or whatever. And I just don't think that stuff is really applicable. And and plus, when I read an, another audio writer, I don't care what his emotional reaction is to some, to, to take an extreme example, a cable. I mean, come on, give me a break. So, um, have I ranted enough? Let me let me rant about something else. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's, let's change your rant a little bit. Let's, get rant. A little, let's go a little scientific. I mean, there's a we were joking with you uh, right before we jumped on how much testing equipment you have behind you, and you were making uh, you know jokes about sometimes it's hard to find it, and there's but there's very few things that you use like all the time. So I, before we ask you about CEA testing, I did want you to show the ear thing and tell people what that is, and just because I think it's cool and it's a good thing. Do you have it readily available? Yeah, it's this is a, a Gras G R A S. Sorry, I'm having I'm having problems relating to the backwardsness of the. Yeah, I know thing. it's it's mirrored, so it's weird. There it is. Okay, so it's you can see it's like a like this rubber ear thing, and then it's got a microphone inside, and um, you know this is sort of what separates the the pros from the amateurs when it comes to headphones, because this doohickey now is about uh, 7,500 bucks or something. Oof. Oh, don't drop and, that. Uh, yeah, as he drops it off the <laughs> Yeah, the alternative doohickey is $200. And it works kind of okay for some things. That's the, the, what it, it's the mini DSP ears. And a lot of people are using that now. But the serious reviewers all have, they make the commitment to have this, because this is industry standard gear. And there are really well-defined standards for headphone measurement. So when I measure stuff, I can look at measurements that are published by somebody else. And yeah, it'll vary a little bit depending on what uh, audio analyzer you're using and what, you know, the, the way the graphics are on the page and things like that and the aspect ratio of the charts. But I can look at what uh, people are doing and know if, and know if their measurements are in the ballpark of mine. And then I can send my measurements to manufacturers if 
find finding something weird and the manufacturers will respect it as opposed to if you're using some cheap stuff they're going to be like yeah. Well, yeah get serious then get back to us be compromised. Um, well we're going to do another percentage way. what percentage of reviewers are, are measuring uh the the audio product that they're reviewing themselves i, I feel it's pretty low it's pretty low um and especially because you know with speakers it's very cheap to do good speaker measurements you can do them with um the Dayton Audio Omni mic is 300 bucks, and I've actually like gotten some of my consulting clients onto using that um, because it does. It's actually based on a really good measurement system called Praxis, and it kind of does everything you need to do, um, and it includes the microphone. Um, so there's no excuse for not doing it, and I think we're going to probably talk about CEA 2010, and CEA 2010 is really cheap to do because the software is free, and um, well, let's dive into no, that. But let me, it's cheap, let, but it's kind of tedious, right? I mean, let me, so let me do a giveaway, it guys. A little work. Let's give away a subwoofer before we jump okay, into this, because I, I love to take care of the people, and That's a good uh, giveaway, Nick. and it's a good segue. Uh, so for our next giveaway, we are going to be doing our PB one thousand subwoofer, a uh, little rock solid ported subwoofer there, coming from Facebook. Dylan Perkins, you are the new owner of a PP1000 subwoofer. Congratulations, Dylan. Our man Vince will reach out to you. Congratulations, and Dylan. All right. So you you brought it up, Brent. CEA 2010 testing. Uh, for, for the people out there who love subwoofers, why don't you give us a layman's uh, explanation of what that is and, and what it involves and why it's important, all that good stuff. Okay. So CEA 2010 measures the maximum output of a subwoofer below you know, certain thresholds of distortion. So you know, once you, it sets different thresholds for different, you know, distortion is, you know, you, you have a, a, a fundamental tone, right? That might be say 50 Hertz. And then there's harmonics. Distortion is the harmonics of that tone at 50 or 150, you know, uh, 200 Hertz, et cetera. So CEA 2010 looks at the level of those harmonics relative to the tone that this, the speakers, the subwoofer is supposed to be producing. And once those, those harmonics get too high in level, it'll say, okay, that's it. That's as far as you go. That's your output level. Um, so the great thing about it is for, you know, for years, subwoofers were, were basically judged by frequency response. You know, how how low can they go if you shove a mic up into them? And uh, the problem with that is a lot of people were EQing their subs to where they were flat down to 20 hertz, which you can do at a very low signal level. But once you start having to move that driver really far back and forth, the driver's gonna run out of steam and the amp's gonna run out of steam really fast. So uh, once people started doing output measurements of subwoofers, the you know, the, the conclusions changed a lot. I, I used to review subs and I find something that measured flat down to 20 and just seemed to have no low base at all. But then I find something that started rolling off at 35, that's 35 Hertz that sounded, uh, that had powerful bass. And so I did my own distortion measurements uh, Oh, back in the late '90s, I guess, to try to pursue this, and then Tom Hussein, who's the uh, who was the, uh, I guess he was like audio technical editor or something of Sound and Vision, um, back in the late '90s, and and uh, most of the twenty, all of the twenty tens, I think. Um, yeah, he really pursued it further, and then sometime in the late two thousands, you know, last decade, uh, Don. Keel, you know, legendary uh, speaker designer and scientist and reviewer, where he used to write for Audio Magazine. Um, Don Keel and Siegfried Linkwitz, also legendary speaker designer and researcher, kind of worked on developing the standard where you could measure the output of the subwoofers, not just the frequency response. And it's a, I started doing it almost right after the, the standard was announced, and uh, which was I think it was actually in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't that uh, long ago. Around. Yeah, so a, a, about a decade ago. And I kind of got into it. And, of course, the spec was, <laughs> as usual, the spec was pretty dicey and unclear. And, you know, a lot of people started, not a lot, four or five or six people started trying to do it and started getting different results. And, but eventually we all kind of, but we, we knew everybody knew everybody else. So we all kind of started to get on the same page. And I wrote a manual for it, which is on my website, printbutterworth.com. And a lot of people started looking at that manual, which by the way, I circulated to all the relevant people. And they said, yeah, that's fine. 
So um, anyway, you can really judge CEA 2010 is something that you can't cheat. It's sort of like, um, you know, like a deadlift and weightlifting, which is supposed to be the, the ultimate test of your strength because there's no way to cheat it. It's just raw strength. CEA 2010, you can't cheat it. Whereas frequency response, there's all sorts of ways you can cheat it with your digital signal processor. You can do some EQ and stuff like that. CEA 2010 is a measure of raw power of your your uh, your driver and your amp, pretty much. Um, and you have to do it outside, so, typically, too, right? Don't you have to go outside with it? And that's like a limitation for a lot yeah, of people because you can't do it in cold weather. There, like, there's, there's some quirks. There are ways to do it indoors. Uh, it's a little complicated. And I do it in my backyard, and I actually came up with a calibration curve for my backyard after going to measure. I measured a test subwoofer out in the park and stuff, and people looked at me like I was just insane. But um, but I did it, and it works. So I, I could set up to do measurements indoors if I had to, but you know, the more stuff, the more clear space, ideally – you know, 50 feet of, well, really like 40 feet of clearance all around you is the ideal. Or you can do it in an anechoic chamber, um, which I don't happen to have, but... Um, <laughs> Not many do. Yeah, so... And that's the it also needs wave, to right? be a massive anechoic chamber. Yeah, the waves, because the base waves are or, so long. Or, or calibrated, but then you're calibrating the anechoic chamber, which is not that much better than my backyard calibration. And Where um, we... I was going to say where we test, um, we have a great anechoic chamber, but it's not big enough for for uh, subwoofer testing. So we go up uh, on the roof yeah. of that building to do the the um, ground plane uh, testing. And um, you know the the uh, some of the folks, our regulars are asking, you know, does C, does uh, SVS use CEA twenty ten? And we totally do. And we and the benefit of CEA twenty ten is that. As you said, it, it can't be fooled, and it allows uh, manufacturers whose goal is, you know, pr performance excellence, to get recognized in an objective way for trying to create a great product. Yeah, and, and that SDS protects the consumer. Was one of the first to do this, as a matter. In fact, I collaborated with SBS and a few other manufacturers when we kind of figured out when we kind of uh, uh, and, and Gene Delasala from Audioholics. Right. And we all kind of figure out how to codify and what like a like a good standard methodology was. And you know, I saw somebody in the comments was saying, "I wonder how his neighbors like it when he does that in his backyard." It's <laughs> funny because with the subwoofers, they can't hear it because it just goes, <laughs> just shakes everything. Like, yeah. and, um, you 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 really it's not now when I measure speakers where you're going from 20k down to 20, going beep, 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 that drives them nuts. So, um, cause that's really loud, but yeah, the, the subwoofers, like they, they never notice it. Um, it's, I have to say CEA 2010 is by far the most fun audio measurement I've ever done. And I've done most of them because you really, you start to see the, the, as you turn the, the, the level up on the subwoofer, you see the fundamental rise, but then you start to see the harmonics appear. And I, I remember I had a manufacturer who, uh, uh, I, I did a CEA 2010 test on his sub and he, so he called me up and he said, what is this stuff? I've never heard of this. And I said, and he happens to live in LA. So I said, well, look, next time I'm measuring someone, you come over. And he saw it and, and, and just instantaneously, he was just like, oh, this is incredible. This is great. And you know, he immediately adopted it. And I think any, any manufacturer who sees it under any 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 uh, any audiophile who sees it can immediately understand the usefulness of it and it does it's not abstract either it really correlates well to user to listener impressions um and the, the and the way that it really to me the greatest value of it is there's so many subwoofers out there uh you know a lot of people will charge you a thousand bucks or something for a, a, a like an eight inch subwoofer with a hundred watt class a you know class a b amp um, which, you know, a lot of people charge 150 bucks for that. Um, and then they'll call it musical and they sell it on that basis. And so audiophiles would go, oh, I don't like those big giant home theater subs. I need a musical subwoofer. Um, but then you start to measure those subwoofers and you're like, this thing's got like nothing below 40 hertz. I mean, well, I think that, that's actually very interesting because we sort of pivoted there from, you know, the very data driven statistical approach of CEA 2010 testing, which I'm sure, you know, you can't hide those results. But, you know, as you're reviewing and critiquing these subwoofers, you know, you mentioned 
putting a measurement on it and using a term to describe it in a certain way to sort of cover for the fact that it's, you know, compromised on some level. Um, you know, what from a spiritual level, I guess I could put it that way, are you looking for when when reviewing a subwoofer outside of the measurement stuff? Are there certain like key elements that, you know, you, you are always looking for and if they're not there, like what is that process like for you? Well, the funny thing is, you know, despite all the measurements I do, the subwoofer still has to sound good. And um, there are elements of the subwoofer sound that you can't judge from CEA 2010 and that are really difficult to judge from frequency response measurements. And that has to do with the Q of the subwoofer, which is, you know, the, the sort of resonant peak of the subwoofer. And, you know, there, there are subwoofers that are sort of very high Q that have a big resonant peak and they sound really boomy. And like the old, um, you know, the old bandpass subwoofers that were really prominent back in the 90s, you know, the, the little boxes that had, you know, that big, really boomy, sorry, she has to say bye-bye. She's getting too fast. <laughs> the nice co Her name. Everybody's asking, like, what's the dog's name? Oh, Missy. It's Missy. There you go. So, um, but uh, uh, where was I? The band pass sorry. boxes. Of the you were oh, saying, you were saying that uh, with the Q can sometimes create, despite the, measure, the measurements, it can create a boomy experience. Yeah, so they would they would create a big resonant peak with and that way they could get a lot of bass out of a little tiny driver and they put they do it in like a funky box that had a couple different ports in it, a couple chambers and they get like this giant resonant peak out of a little driver but that's all it would do so that's that's where you get your one note bass concept from and um you know i'm kind of listening for that and i think you know to me as especially as a, as an upright bass player there are subwoofers that just don't sound right to me. And sometimes they sound too punchy. Like you'll put a, I mean, upright basses don't sound punchy unless you put them through an amp. And uh, so, if some, and you know, usually the upright bass is mic'd in the recording. And so if the upright bass sounds really, puh, 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 that's not what upright bass sounds like. And by the same token, it, yeah, you can make a boomy upright bass recording, and I have, but no one tries to do that. And so if, the, if it's just like this boom, like a synth bass kind of thing, like, like you might get on an EDM recording and the upright bass mm -hmm. sounds like that, to me, that's really bad. And subwoofers can make both of those errors, and you want it somewhere kind of in between. But, you know, the really good subwoofer, to me, sounds like um, sounds like a, a well-recorded double bass and, and also plays loud as hell. And then you get into the home theater side of it and you start to want it to make those huge explosions. And there are subwoofers that can do both. So do you have some so, standard tracks in uh, like scenes and movies that you use when evaluating all subwoofers to sort of set a benchmark or are you, you know, more whatever strikes you in the moment? No, I use, um, there is, <laughs> you guys will hate me for this. The opening of, um, I can never remember the name of that movie. It's that Tom Cruise movie where he oh, goes Edge of Tomorrow. And, Edge, of tomorrow. Edge, of, Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, there's like a yeah. 16 hertz tone in the in the beginning of that, <laughs> which apparently so is be careful with that one. Yeah, uh, we, you got to be careful. With it, disclaimer right? out there that you guys need to be careful with that movie. Start low volume before you go cranking it. Yes, your subwoofer. Now, granted, all subs, I hope, have protection circuits in it, where they they will just stop moving at that point, but don't, but still be careful with that. Yeah. So I, you don't, don't crank your sub and then play the beginning of that movie. Cause you, you know, you could have some problems, but uh, I use that. I use um, the opening of uh, the second star Wars movie. Uh, what was it called? Attack of the clones. Um, where there's like a spaceship that flies over. And that's really useful. You can, there's a lot of sort of detail in their recording of it. And some stuff kind of doesn't do it at all. Um, what else do I use? There's a scene from, I think it's Thor Ragnarok. I, I have these, these Blu-rays just like sitting in a pile. <laughs> so I, I can not always remember the name of the movie, um, from Thor Ragnarok where Thor and the Hulk fight and they're kind the of arena. Yeah. Yeah. And I can probably tell you the exact chapter and time because it, it's Larry's on. Got that one dialed up. And actually, yeah. I should. I should mention uh, one of our uh, our original subwoofer demos that we you know played at the first CES I went to with SVS. Tron Legacy turned ten yesterday, guys. Tron Legacy. Oh. So uh, we look forward to getting back out into the world and demoing that for people and making our uh, audio show uh, 
you know, roommates on either side, uh, you know, knock on the walls and whatnot. But that's yes, a good, August, that's on time. And that reminds me, because I'm seeing in the comments, are you guys going to keep doing uh, our SVS uh, virtual audio file happy hours after COVID, which I think there's going to be an after COVID, which ex ex is exciting in and of itself. And absolutely, we love doing these. So we'll keep doing our physical events uh, as soon as we can. We'll go back to that. But uh, I think um, we all have decided we want to keep doing the virtual audio file happy hours. Yeah. And Nick, there were easy. comments not to bring up Tron, and you did it. So I'm kind of getting a kick out of that. And Sarah Bruno, mm -hmm. yes, uh, she keeps trying to make us laugh with funny comments, and I'm just trying to keep my face straight. I'm uh, seeing comments not to bring up the Ninja Turtles. So, Larry, you got uh, no, no Ninja Turtles. Well, oh, you Brent, I don't want to. I, I don't want to let you go yet, but we do have to do another giveaway. We are at uh, six forty-five now, East Coast time, and uh, our prize now is going to be a Prime Wireless powered speaker pair. Uh, and this winner is coming from YouTube, and his name is Mark Wilson. Congratulations, Mark Wilson from YouTube. Hey, Mark, you got yourself a pair of Prime Wireless powered speakers there to uh, rock out to this holiday season. So. Uh, Brent, I'm curious, you know, being sort of, uh, you know, having visibility into what's happening in the world of audio, do you have thoughts on where the future of high performance audio is headed? And can you look into your crystal ball and tell us maybe about some things that people might not expect, um, you know, that are coming down the pipeline? Uh, sort of obvious, you know, the obvious sort of thing is, is powered speakers. You know, that's, that's the wave of the future. And everybody says that. And even like high end amp designers, I know, say that um, because it's the right way to do it. It's the best way to do it. Um, you know, there's the auto EQ thing, but that has, that has been, uh, at least as much bad as good, but people, people are getting better at it and you're, you're not seeing some of the crazy things that just make the system sound weird, but those are still out there. Um, there's so much wisdom now about, uh, uh I'm seeing so many articles now where they talk about doing room correction and limiting the, the top frequency to 200 hertz or 300 hertz or something and that's just such a good idea it's such it's it's been the right thing to do for 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 decades and everybody who really knows what they're talking about does that and, and recommends it and uh as far as the, the yeah, i think that you know ultimately systems that are powered where the devices all work together and you can stream whatever because you know it's, it's a streaming world now and yes yeah, some of us have our vinyl and some of us have maybe cds or something and maybe some high-res downloads but it's a streaming world now and um you know young people are never gonna own a cd what about what about binaural are you doing uh, any testing or consulting on with binaural audio and you know what what's uh what's the future for that look like I feel like I had some little project like eight or ten years ago. It all, you know. No. Okay. Um, well, I, well, the thing is, though, I think I was listening literally right before you guys. I talked to you guys. I was testing a hot new product, hot new headphones. <laughs> you know, There's no sarcasm there. Wonder which one that was. So, um, but I was listening to a Chesky binaural binaural plus recording, and binaural is fantastic. And those Chesky recordings are great, but Chesky has already kind of somewhat abandoned it. Um, you know, I think that, uh, and, you know, Chesky kind of tweaked them to make them sound better with speakers, but uh, Binaural works with headphones and, and I, I, I completely love it, but um, I just don't see that as ever really taking off, especially when you're starting to get more into things like Dolby Atmos for headphones. Right. And that is... And that's something, and Dolby has made it really, really easy for the recording industry to do productions in Atmos. Like they've really gone out of their way to, to where it isn't some $20,000 investment. It's a really pretty modest investment. And I think, and, and the industries, you know, I read a lot of recording, you know, pro magazines, and they're really embracing it. And you know, even the jazz industry, I mean, Blue Note's doing Atmos mixes and stuff, which had never happened before. So, I think that's going to kind of, and you know, Atmos will give you some of that kind of thing that you're looking for with binaural, but without having to have a special recording that doesn't really work that well on anything else. Because you know, the Atmos can be decoded in a way to suit whatever your your system happens to be. So yeah, I, know. I think that, that's probably the biggest deal coming up down the pike is more Atmos stuff, and it's still in it's it's still in a very embryonic phase right now. 
Yeah, and, and I know that's always one of the most popular topics. And we've had two guests on who've been involved on the production side of um, one mixing uh, Atmos with music. And then last week, or the last broadcast we had was more with movies. And, uh, you know, I think all the, the content providers are embracing it now. And, you know, so I think that's uh, clearly, it's been around for a while, but it's nice to see the adoption rate really picking up now. Um, so I want to give you the opportunity to tease anything that uh, you're working on now. Is there any projects upcoming that people can look out for, uh, you know, with the Brent Butterworth byline on it? Uh, what, what's the future? Or, or your, uh, did you tease your specific music that you're that you're recording, Brent? Because I think you should. Oh, I, didn't. I guess I, I, I could I could give you a link. If you go to um, if you go to YouTube and you search for Outrageous 8 Records, Outrageous spelled outrageous, and then numeral eight records. Um, I have a jazz duo called Take Two, and we have some videos. We just started doing it. Uh, I played with this guy. I played gigs with this guy for a few years now. And um, we just, in the absence of gigs now, we decided to start doing recordings. And somebody found out about it, and they said, why don't you guys make a record? So we have uh, four tunes out on YouTube right now, and we're in, slowly in the process of, of, of getting a record together. But you can go look on YouTube for Outrageous 8 Records and you can find Take Two or you look for Brent Butterworth or whatever. And a couple of them are on my YouTube channel, I think. Um, but you can find something and you can see if you think I suck or not. Um, well, we're, we know you don't suck. And and you're you're actually going to drop a formal album. Uh, you, don't, you don't have the exact date, but early next year, right? Yeah, I think my, my hope is into January. My, my, you know, of course, it'll probably take till February, you know, end of February. But we have, uh, we have four tunes recorded. We have two more we are recording that are in various stages of repair. Uh, and then we have um, a couple more that are, you know, written and slated. We just haven't recorded them yet. So, um, you know. well, when it's when it's in the can and you're talking to the public about it, would you consider coming back on our show? You're a great guest. Oh, you're getting to. so many positive comments here. I'd love to. Sure. Um, I'd I'd love to come on, and I, you know, I can, you know, I, then I'll have a link to an album that's on, I don't know, Spotify or who, where, wherever we put it, um, that people could actually go and listen to. That'll actually be finally mixed and mastered. I mean, these, honestly, these videos we kind of cranked out. We just did a mix. It's like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Do it. And we shot the videos with a cell phone, and <laughs> but they look they look okay. Missy's in uh, Missy's in two of them. So oh, well, there you go. That's She's in she double duty. I think um, most of I the think... comments have been to Missy, by the way, more than more than <laughs> to any of us. Nobody cares about it. dogs. Dogs. I should have gotten into the dog industry, not the <laughs> not the audio industry. Well, Brent, I feel like we've only scratched the dog magazine once. So <laughs> I feel like we've only scratched the surface on uh, some of your knowledge, but I greatly appreciate you coming on next year. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get out to California and see you play live. That's what I'm excited about. Yep, I, I agree. Want the album. I want to go out there and, uh, and hang out. Our album, our album gets some traction, and and some agent calls me up and says, "Why don't you do a world tour and and uh, and you can make uh, like a hundred bucks a night?" <laughs> I'm sure Rhode Island will be your first stop. Or Youngstown. And, uh, followed by Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, but again, yeah. thank you, Brent, so much. Thanks uh, so much, Brent. Brent. This was great. You. you got so thank many you, positive Missy. comments. Yep. And oh, Missy, no. thank you for not barking. Uh, and cheers. We'll uh, we'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, everybody. Right, thank, thank you. you. Great stuff. Uh, so what do we got? Oh, about five minutes left here. I think we have time to go through a couple of my home theater blunders before we get to uh, the you know what? Giveaway. I think that's no? I think that's a good topic. And so I, I feel like we should have we should give it a little more time. Let's okay. do it in the next show. I mean, unless you just no, I, I, it's gonna be rushed. Back. Yeah, it's gonna be rushed if we do it now. So I think uh, what it's you guys started topic. talking about with streaming. Um, you know, particularly the news that dropped. And I don't think I really let you get it out full, fully, Larry. So what, what's the deal with Warner Media and HBO Max? And, uh, you know, I'd just like to hear your guys' thoughts on how this is changing, you know, what you're doing with streaming. Well, I, I think everybody knows that pretty much every new release movie has been delayed, uh, especially the big blockbusters. And everything under the Warner umbrella for 2021, they announced is going to go to HBO Max. And you know, there's a lot of differing opinions on it. Um, I am a movie theater guy, but, you know, I also work for SVS, so I listen to everything twice, everywhere, and uh, play just as loud in both situations. But uh, now we're all going to have the opportunity to see all these great flicks 
come to the house via HBO Max. And they just signed, what was it yesterday or this morning with Roku? So now they're on all the major streaming platforms as well. So everybody for what, 12 bucks a month or whatever the cost is, 15 bucks a month. Uh, I pay six months in advance, so I don't know. But uh, it's going to have access to this. And Christmas Day, we're getting Wonder Woman 1984. And then there's all these movies coming down the pipe. Uh, so you're going to have content. And then Netflix keeps launching stuff. They have a big release this week, you know, the George Clooney movie coming up. And uh, there's a lot of content that's going to become available for us to watch at home. And almost all of it's coming in Atmos. And I think that was the big knock on HBO Max for the longest time was, that it wasn't an Atmos. But, you know, yeah. I, I find that really interesting because we uh, uh, were not the only ones that said, what's up with this? They're not doing uh, um, 4K. They're not doing Dolby Atmos. And now they are. So yeah. it almost makes you feel like the, the world spoke and told them, hey, come on, let's ha let's get this. Let's get the production values up. There are some people with great home theaters that are really going to appreciate it. Obviously, 4K TVs are almost ever it seems like anyone you know with a, a middle class background at least has a 4k tv and um i think hbo max is just an exciting service i mean i i find myself finding all kinds of cool content like that flight attendant they did the unfollowing and, and they i mean just go there and find all kinds of stuff they have the whole um uh what was called the uh, turner classics i don't know what it's called now yeah, TCM, but, yeah. They have a massive library of classic movies, so it's cool. It's it's fun watching these streaming services compete because we win. Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, and HBO Max are my four top ones, and they're all fighting it out. You know, and I think it's the one of the hurdles. I think is like I get sticker shock when I'm about to watch a movie and like rent it through my smart TV, and it's twenty bucks. But once that becomes like the norm, like people are going to be like, well, it's so much cheaper than going to a theater. And and I don't think any one of us want this to be like the nail on the coffin for movie theaters. Like that is not what we're about. Yeah. But I think it's it's you know adapt or die at this point. You really have to to do what what people are asking for. You're going to have this content. It's going to come out. Like make it as easy as possible for people to get. You know what I think? Uh, here's my prediction. If you want my futurist prediction, uh, and and uh, I've been thinking this before this happened, but last night, uh, you know, we're in D.C. and we got hit with the nor'easter, and um, we lost broadcast TV. We have Direct TV, you know. And I, my joke to my wife was, "Well, it's raining. We don't get to watch TV when it rains," and um, so we didn't have TV. Uh, all the way through until about noon today when the snow, I guess, blew off the dish and or the two dishes because it's H yeah. HD. Um, and I realized I didn't even miss it. And I, I think that it's all going to go. It cut the cord. Obviously, it's a it's a trend. I think many of us are going to be fine. Uh, and a lot of that budget uh, will go to these streaming services. So um, and there'll be I think Hulu already has the or is it Hulu? that has the ability to get local channels and other things without having a cable thing. I'm, I'm, I'm in a mindset that some of the, if these cable companies and, and satellite companies don't get their stuff together, they're going to be uh, history. Yeah. Larry, any final thoughts you want to add before we get to our ultra mega giveaway of the evening? I don't know, man. I'm pretty, th there's so much going on right now, all this new content. And I told my family earlier today that Christmas day, we're watching Wonder Woman and then watching the Mavericks. I am so stoked for the NBA season to be starting back up again. And uh, I hope all of you are as well because uh, that's going to be fun. It's not Atmos, but, you know, it's going to sound Well, my good. Wizards are tied for first place right now. So oh, you can say that. Last, you can say but, that now. Um, so uh, we should repeat the system and probably show the picture because this Absolutely. is big. And did we did we say the price of it? Because it's cool. We did. You, you read my mind, Gary. I'm going to flash this up here. How's that looking for you? So uh, our final giveaway of the evening, as mentioned at the top of the show, it's uh, valued at right around $2,500. What you get, uh, and Gary gave you the option, you can get our stunning piano gloss white as shown here, ultra bookshelf speakers, brand new finish for the SB2000 Pro subwoofer, and then our prime wireless sound base. And of course, we'll be including our SoundPath Ultra speaker cables and RCA audio interconnect. Uh, this is a ready to rock 2.1 system. Uh, really a phenomenal uh, piece of work here that, uh, you know, we could go through the sound base specs, but I think uh, most people here who have watched know what they are. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, it's a really great system. So uh, with that said, uh, I'll do my own little drum roll here. Our winner- I'm Drum rolling too. For the 2.1 system is Zach Pence from Facebook. Congratulations, Zach oh, Pence. Yeah. 
Congrats, you are Jack. Uh, Vince will reach out to you. The biggest prize we've ever given, I think. The biggest prize mm-hmm. we've ever given away, but I'm certain certain it won't be the last as we have some new uh, announcements forthcoming we into the new pro- year. We have some products coming, some more stuff to give away. So we'll be having some fun with that. Congratulations, Zach. Uh, we'll hopefully get some pictures of that system when it's all set up because I think people will be interested to see that. Uh, so our next broadcast will actually be in the new year. This is our last one of 2020. Um, I personally think this has been one of the best things that uh, I've ever done at SVS and been a part of. So as Gary said, we're going to continue it into the new year. Our next broadcast will be January 7th. That's a Thursday, as we always do, at 6 p.m. Eastern time, January 7th. So we'll join you there. Uh, Gary, any closing thoughts you want to share with the uh, community? Yeah, as happy this is to our say goodbye to 2020, 2020, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are. Good riddance. Yeah. All right, so, guys. Thanks thank you, Brett. Be with the SBS you, community. Be well, everybody. Have a wonderful yep. holidays and a happy we'll new year. We'll talk to you down the road. Thanks, Bye, guys. Everybody.